Naval aviation had gained power, reach, numbers and precision, but was still untested in battle. Starting in 1929, the Navy began a series of war games called Fleet Problems that put Reeves' theories to the test. None proved as prophetic as the vast Pacific exercise known as Fleet Problem 13. On February 7, 1932, the carriers Lexington and Saratoga peeled away from the fleet and sailed towards Hawaii. 152 planes were dispatched to attack Pearl Harbor with dummy bombs. In the mock assault, they pounded the airfields and port facilities. And why it's so important is because it showed that the carrier could operate independently and operate as its own task force and did not need to have the battle line there for support. And it showed the offensive firepower of the aircraft carrier. The Navy minimized the risks of an attack by carriers. For the next decade, the old strategy stayed largely unchanged. These are tough times. This is the Depression. We had existing battleships. They were there. They were paid for. They were, we knew exactly how to employ them. And they worked. But Fleet Problem 13 did not go unnoticed. Across the Pacific, the Japanese studied it closely. Over the next decade, they would expand their fleet of large carriers to six. They would build the Zero, a state-of-the-art fighter plane. they would train 3,500 naval pilots. The carrier force that moved toward Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 was the largest and most powerful in the world. In a bitter irony, Pearl Harbor would stand as the first real world proof that carrier aviation was the next super weapon. Devastation at Pearl Harbor was the work of carriers. 350 Japanese planes launched from hundreds of miles out at sea. In just two hours, they wiped out most of the battleships of the Pacific Fleet. It was a master stroke. Japan had not been stopped, and there were some people in the United States who believed Japan couldn't be stopped that eventually Japan would not only control all of China, the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies, but the northern coast of Australia, possibly even India. In the United States, the loss of the battleships upended every plan for how a war in the Pacific could be fought and won. By sheer luck, three aircraft carriers had been spared. They were out at sea during the attack. You have this bizarre situation that the Japanese attack with aircraft carriers forces the United States into a carrier-based naval strategy. It was now up to the U.S. carriers to hold the line against Japan's Imperial Navy. In June of 1942, the Japanese fleet moved toward a pair of small American-held islands in the Pacific. 
Midway Atoll was just a thousand miles west of Hawaii and strategically important. A threat of invasion was sure to draw a full-out American response. It was designed as a perfect trap. The American sortie with about 50 ships. Three of them are aircraft carriers. They're facing off against what look to be impossible odds. The enemy has vast, vast numbers of ships, almost 200 ships. They've sorted the entire combined fleet. The morning of June 4th did not start well for the Americans. Radar on Midway began tracking 107 incoming Japanese planes. Within minutes, every operational U.S. plane was in the air. The Japanese bombers swept through the defenses. Out at sea, the U.S. carriers Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown launched their planes, hoping to hit the Japanese carriers before they could unleash a second strike. Three squadrons of TBD Devastator torpedo planes reached the Japanese fleet. Flying at wave top level, they were easy prey for anti-aircraft fire. Of 41 torpedo planes, only four survived. Not one torpedo scored. The early strikes that morning, both from Midway and from the American carriers, suffer crippling losses. The casualties were just insane. Of the men and aircraft that launched that morning, about half did not return. Meanwhile, two squadrons of SBD Dauntless dive bombers launched from the Enterprise in search of the Japanese carriers. They were led by a 40-year-old lieutenant commander from Buffalo, New York, named Wade McCluskey. McCluskey gets out to the point where he's been told the Japanese fleet will be waiting for you there. Gets out there, butkus. Nothing in sight. Staring at the vast expanse of ocean, McCluskey had to decide whether to return his men to the Enterprise or lead them on a fool's errand. And McCluskey decides, well, I'm going to take my force of two squadrons of dive bombers and I'm going to have them follow me on a very methodical search pattern. Now, he has a little problem. He's running low on gas. And more than a few of his pilots are looking at their gas gauges, wondering if the old man really knows what he's doing. And then McCluskey spots a Japanese destroyer. He figures, that Japanese destroyer is going at high speed towards something. I'll bet you that's the Japanese fleet. McCluskey followed the destroyer. Approaching from the south, he spotted three Japanese carriers. His bombers plunged into their dives, catching two of the carriers by complete surprise. (laughs) 
Minutes later, a third U.S. squadron stumbled on the scene and attacked. As McCluskey looked behind, through the tall columns of smoke, he was stunned. The Americans had sunk three carriers, along with some 300 aircraft and nearly 4,000 men. That man and that action took the Japanese Navy essentially out of the war at that moment. The Japanese have gone from an absolute position of supremacy to they never go on the offensive ever again. And it all came down to about th oh, four dozen dive bombers. The pilots who followed McCluskey that day were ordinary men. Many were newly enlisted. They had no right to win, but they did. And in doing so, they changed the course of a war. The Battle of Midway was the most decisive single naval battle in U.S. history. Over the course of World War II, Navy airplanes would provide the dominant firepower in every important battle in the Pacific. Carrier aviation had proved itself beyond measure. 